Hi there everyone, once again today we're going to do a lucky dip White Gloves of Destiny from the card catalogue and again we're letting one of our Patreon supporters do the pick. This is Sean from Melbourne. How you doing Sean? Yeah, good thanks. And seeing you from Melbourne, what's your Aussie Rules football team? I'm a bit naughty, I don't have one. You haven't got one? Well you should no. be, an, you, can become an, an, you can become an honorary Adelaide Crows supporter because they're my football okay. team. Keith Moore here, he's the head librarian at the Royal Society. He's going to do it for you, but you're going to guide the gloves from afar, from the other side of the world. You can tell him left or right or up or down to choose a draw. Right to the bottom. Right to the bottom? Yep. You happy with that? Yep. Alright. Okay. And then how deep do you want him to go? He'll move his hands and you tell him when to stop. Oh, uh, yep. So we have a paper from the 18th century by John Latham, and it's a dropsical case. What does a dropsical case mean? Do well, you know? we're about to find out. We're going medical. OK, it looks like you've got something medical there, Sean, but just in case you got a dud, we're going to give you one more pick from another drawer. This time, top row. Top, top right. right. OK, top right. Here we go. Right at the back. Right at the back. Yeah. OK. So we've got a, a paper by William Molyneux and remarks on Mr. Hautfeville's method for shortening telescopes without lessening the effect. You happy with what you got? You looking good? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. All right. Well, I know it's bedtime down there in Melbourne, so you go and get some beauty sleep. We'll go downstairs and see what you got and we'll tell you later on, all right? No worries. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Nice to meet you. That was good. Cheers. You too. Okay. Letters and papers, 772. Right, so we're going to have to roll the stacks now and squash James, which yeah. is great. <laughs> Here's our letters and paper sequence. We're going to be down here, I think, somewhere. So up to 78, so that's right. the one we need, I think. There's one. So the backup is the copy register books, which are just around the corner. So that's going to be that one there. Okay, let's see how Sean has done. All right, Keith, so the Latham paper about a dropsical case. 772? Yep, let's take a look and just see what we have. Okay. As usual, you might want to just see, have a look at all the great things that he missed. Yeah, <laughs> what you could have won. Oh, Benjamin Wilson, some electrical experiments there. Oh, yeah, very good. A bit of mathematics there. Yeah, that's some hardcore mathematics. Mm, quite near the back. Oh, here we go. 72. Here it is. It looks like it's just a standard letter. We haven't got any dramatic diagrams or pictures or anything like that. Oh, uh, no, that's just a straight case from... Oh, here he is, John Latham. And he's writing from... Dartford. So this is the 28th of October 1778. The Dartford address is a bit of a giveaway, I think, because this must be the John Latham who discovered the Dartford warbler, a kind of bird. He was a great collector and illustrator, and he produced engravings of quite exotic creatures, including some of the birds that were found in Australia, including by Sir Joseph Banks, whom he knew. So Latham's a fellow of the Royal Society and quite quite an important figure. So he's written this letter to Mr. Warner, who's a surgeon in Hatton Street, London. So he sent this to a fellow of the Royal Society. So when I last had the pleasure of seeing you, it was your opinion that the Royal Society would receive some satisfaction in my giving some account of the case of Miss A.H. or A.M who died lately of dropsy under my care. This patient and is cut there, so we can't quite read that word. Of a, had a lively constitution? Of a, well, it looks like F of possibly florid, lively constitution, but from a child was subject to a violent eruption, which came generally on a sudden, covering the whole neck, breast, and often a great part of the face. Things continued thus until the autumn of 1773, when the menses became obstructed. So she's having a menstrual cycle here, and for some reason there, there's an obstruction. And this is going to get serious by the sound of it. Mm. Her abdomen began to increase in size every day and became painful with thirst and every other symptom of an approaching dropsy. We now know that dropsy is like edema mm. and water collecting. 1776, for the most part, underwent aspiration every eight or nine days, the internals gradually shortening till by the end of the year she could go no longer than a week, between which continued till the day of her death. 
which happened on May the 14th, 1778. She was 23 years old. Very young indeed, and mm. of course, without modern medical treatment, people, people did die young. I have good reason to suppose the complaint originated from a disease of the left ovary. After first tapping, I felt a substance of the size of a cricket ball. As if operations went on, this became more and more manifest, increasing so much as at last to occupy the whole space of the abdomen forward. I'm just interested in the reference to a cricket ball. I forgot <laughs> Australian. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, they were playing cricket in the 18th century. I know scholars are always looking for early references to cricket balls to find oh, out when okay. and where it was popular, so... Uh, there we go. Sorry, I'm distracted, <laughs> distracted from this serious medical case this by a reference to a cricket ball. This is why you never became a doctor, Brady, is it? Uh, a medical doctor? Well, maybe. Oh, and Sean's yeah. Australian, so he might be interested oh, well, in the yeah. cricket Absolutely. ball reference. Absolutely medical fellows, other physicians and surgeons might have been interested in this, but it didn't really tell them very much, apart from a description of yeah. symptoms, and they might recognise th th those sorts of things in a similar case. Should we have a look at this well, other one? I think we ought to, yeah. I, th I think this is going to be right. a bit more cheerful and less death involved. Now, this is a nice fair copy, Brady, so you're going to easily get your way through that. I don't think so. I think this is even harder to read. Remarks on Mr. Hopeville's method for shortening telescopes without lessening the effect by Dr. Dr. Molyneux. William Molyneux, yeah. All ah, right, so the author seems herein to make the magnifying of telescopes to depend on the smallness or greatness of the angle subtended by the breadth of the object glass, as in this case, the telescope that has the object glass, A, B, figure. So there are figures there associated are figures. with this, but not in this copy version, oh. which is a bit of a shame, I think. Teasingly, we're being referred to figures and diagrams, but we're not getting to see them. Which would be in the original manuscript that this is a copy of. And that the angle of attention of this telescope, it's very technical. So it's, just, so, so it's a technical paper about the mm, configuration of telescopes. That's right, and, and you need the drawings to be able to understand it. Let's see if there's any conclusions on the end. He had then better never have troubled the world with it, oh. especially considering <laughs> that the proposal is not new at all. So he's saying you shouldn't have even bothered. Like, yeah, why bother writing this rubbish down? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, it's not a great review. Really. So this is like, he's writing about someone else's paper and saying this other person's yeah. paper was a heap of rubbish. This next one would have been good. Yeah. A discourse tending to explicate the modus of the rising of vapours out of water by Edmund Halley. Yeah, I saw the one before it as well, just as we were starting to read that paper, concerning the weight of the parts of eggs. Oh, that would have been a That'd good be one. That would have been good. Look, hen's eggs. The skin, the shell, the yolk and the white. That's, that's the sort of science we like, a bit of culinary stuff. So, Sean, you almost picked a good one. You were sandwiched between two good ones. But yours was a bit boring. So they cut away all of this space, leaving only the lines of the diagrams and those little lettering behind. I imagine that was quite a skill. It's like really fine, detailed lines and... Absolutely, it was a very specialized skill. You'd need to be a trained block cutter to do. Do we have any clue what kind of wood this might be made from or...? We think this is pear wood. From a pear tree? Yes. Not an apple tree? I know. It, it would be lovely if it were apple, but uh, we don't think so. 